Um, so next we're gonna get started with Dr. Myers, our board certified surgeon. And um, let me just start her off here. Okay, hello. Okay, okay, so, okay. All right, so bear with me. I kind of have my notes on this computer, so I'll try to look at you guys, but we'll see how this goes. Um, so I'm gonna talk today about portosystemic shunts, um, pre and post-op management. Um, let's see, you can see how technologically savvy I am. Is she good? Is that? Oh, you have to do Or click. Click? Yep. Okay. This is a great start. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk about, we'll talk about the background of shunts, clinical signs, how we diagnose them, medical and surgical management, complications, and prognosis. Okay, so there are three separate categories of liver vascular disease. Um, we see portosystemic shunts, disorders associated with abnormal hepatic blood flow, and disturbances of portal outflow. Disorders associated with abnormal hepatic blood flow are known as primary hypoplasia of the portal vein with or without hypotension. Um, disturbances of portal outflow are hepatic arterial venosis malformations or AV malformations. Um, this picture here is a picture of a hepatic AV malformation in a right medial slide. And they'll be able to see my arrow when I, yep. okay, cool. Uh, before we get into the details of shunts, I did just want to touch base briefly on primary hypoplasia of the portal vein without portal hypertension, which was previously termed mycovascular dysplasia. Mycovascular dysplasia is a pathologic description associated with many conditions. So what we used to call mycovascular dysplasia, we're now calling PVH MVD. I will occasionally still say mycovascular dysplasia in this talk, just kind of going back to old habits, but um, try to remember it as that condition. On histopathology, this condition is characterized by small intrahepatic portal vessels, portal endothelial hyperplasia, portal vein dilation, random juvenile intralobular blood vessels, and central venous hypertrophy. Essentially, it is communication between the portal and systemic um, circulation at the microvascular level. It can occur as a primary disease or in combination with a congenital portosystemic shunt. When it's seen as a primary disease, the signs are often less severe, they present later in life, and they have a better long-term prognosis with medical management alone. Predisposed breeds include Karen Terriers, Maltese, and Yorkies, um, and it has been reported in 58% of dogs and 87% of cats with PBH MVD have concurrent macroscopic shunts. Portosystemic shunts are vascular anomalies that allow portal blood to bypass the liver and enter the systemic circulation. Congenital portosystemic shunts often occur secondary to inappropriate closure of different portions of the fetal vasculature. They are reported in 0.18% of all dogs. They most commonly occur as a single intra or extrahepatic vessel. In dogs and cats, 66 to 75 percent of dogs of, um, sorry, 66 to 75 percent of congenital single portosystemic shunts are extrahepatic. Congenital intrahepatic portosystemic shunts result from persistence of the ductus venosus, or form during fetal development of hepatic sinusoids and portal vessels. Most intrahepatic portosystemic shunts are found in large breed dogs, such as Irish Wolfhounds, Labrador Retrievers. Old English Sheepdogs, and Australian Shepherds. Acquired portosystemic shunts most commonly occur secondary to chronic portal hypertension. Increased portal pressures result in opening of vestigial fetal blood vessels. They are usually multiple torturous and extrahepatic in nature, as you can see in this picture. So you can see all these kind of torturous vessels here. The most common causes of acquired shunts are hepatic fibrosis, congenital non serotic portal hypertension, and hepatic AV malformations. For this presentation, I'm going to focus mostly on the treatment of single extrahepatic congenital shunts because that's what we tend to see in practice most commonly. So in general, vascular shunts are named using the name of the portal vessel from which the shunt emanates and the name of the systemic vein to which it joins and feeds. The tributaries of the portal vein from caudal to cranial include the caudal mesenteric vein, which drains the colon and proximal rectum, the cranial mesenteric vein, which drains the small intestines, 
the splenic vein, which receives blood from the spleen and from the stomach via the left gastric. And then in dogs, the gastroduodenal vein, which drains portions of the pancreas, duodenum, and the stomach. And so here's just a simplified schematic of the portal tributary. So the ones that we see most commonly associated with shunt are going to be your splenic, your left gastric, and then your right gastric. I'm just going to move this here, I think. We'll see. I'll just keep moving it back and forth. So in general, shunts are classified as congenital or acquired, extrahepatic or intrahepatic, and single versus uh, multiple. Like I said, we're focusing today on single congenital extrahepatic portosystemic shunts, which are historically classified as either portal cable, inserting on the cauda vena cava, or portal zygus, inserting on the zygus. More detailed descriptions of which tri tributary uh, vessel of the portal vein they originate from and where they insert were lacking predominantly due to the method, method by which shunts were imaged. As more advanced imaging is becoming standard of care, we've come better at being able to identify the anatomy and better characterizing shunt morphology. So there have been several recent publications by a group led by Ron White that have described in detail the most common shunt type seen. Um, these studies concluded that there was consistency of morphology for the most common shunt types and that with each type, the site of communication between the shunt and systemic circulation was highly consistent and anatomically well-defined. A comprehensive literature review of congenital extrahepatic shunt morphology was also performed recently and concluded that in dogs, um, there are four consistent shunt types were responsible for 94% of the shunts reported in that species. These were splenocaval, left gastrophrenic, left gastroazygous, and those involving the right gastric vein. In cats, there are three consistent shunt types responsible for 92% of extrahepatic shunts reported, including splenocaval, left gastrophrenic, and left gastrocaval. Um, knowing these different types is mostly academic, but it's also important because there are certain factors that are being discovered related to clinical signs, time of presentation, and shunt morphology, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, I like this schematic of a, this is a splenocaval shunt, and you can see in this initial image where the, um, the shunt between the splenic vein and the chema is, and how it kind of develops into this classic image that we see on a portogram here of a splenocaval shunt. These are a couple other additional examples of portograms that we can see commonly in dogs. So you've got a left gastrozygous with the shunt being here, left gastrophrenic here, and right gastrocaval. They kind of always have this crossing over here. So just different types of shunts that we see. Extrahepatic shunts are most commonly seen in small and toy breed dogs, as you know. Um, we see them in Yorkies, Norwegian Terriers, Maltese, Pugs, Miniature Schnauzers, and Havanese. In a study of more than 2,400 dogs in North America, the above, the above breeds I just mentioned were identified to have an odds ratio of near 20 or greater for occurrence of congenital porterostomic shunts. In another study, Yorkies were reported to have an odds ratio of 35.9 35.9 times greater than all other breeds combined. In cats, portostomic shunts seem to be more commonly reported in domestic short hairs, Persian, Siamese, Himalayans, and Burmese. Uh, most dogs and cats with single congenital portostomic shunts present with signs of chronic or acute illness at a young age, one month to two years. Um, although some animals can present when they're over 10 years of age. There was a recent study that showed that miniature schnauzers were significantly more likely to present at seven years of age or older compared with all other breeds combined. There is no clear gender predisposition for congenital portostomic shunts in dogs of affected felines. Um, males may be overrepresented. These cases often present with a history of failure to thrive since birth. Um, reported history include small stat stature or run to the liver, litter, sorry, um, history of weight loss or failure to gain weight, intermittent episodes of dullness, lethargy, or bizarre behavior, such as head pressing and staring, and also a history of anesthesia intolerance. The most common clinical signs we see result from abnormalities of the nervous system, urinary tract, and digestive system. Clinical signs can range from very mild to severe, and in some cases can be absent. So an asymptomatic, a congenital portostomic shunt is usually suspected based on preoperative or annual blood work.
Hepatic encephalopathy is the cause of majority of the clinical signs seen in patients with quarter stomach shunts. The pathogenesis is largely unknown and complex in human and veterinary medicine. A healthy liver filters a multitude of neurotoxic substances that are absorbed across the GI barrier and drain through the portal system. With portosystemic shunts, the blood is being diverted, allowing some of these toxic substances to enter the systemic circulation, leading to the clinical signs seen. More than 20 different compounds have been found in excess in circulation when liver function is impaired. Ammonia is often considered the most important neurotoxic substance. It is produced by GI flora from protein breakdown in the colon and converted in the normal liver to urea and glutamate by the urea cycle. The excess of ammonia along with other toxic substances lead to the most common clinical signs, including behavioral changes, depression, disorientation, seizures, blindness, ataxia, and coma. We often think of these signs being exacerbated after a meal. Correlation of onset of signs with meal ingestion has been reported in 30 to 50% of cases. And seizures seem to be much more common in cats. They're reported in over 65% of cats with portosystemic shunts. GI signs that can be seen um, include vomiting, diarrhea, pica, and evidence of GI bleeding, such as melana or hematemesis. These occur in approximately 30% of dogs and are less frequent in cats. Um, it's much more common to see preoperative GI hemorrhage in dogs that have an intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Hypersalvation is um, extremely common in cats, seen in about 75% of cats, and is thought to be a manifestation of hepatic encephalopathy or GI upset. Ascites is actually very uncommon with congenital portostomic shunts. It's usually an indication of multiple acquired shunts or a hepatic AV malformation. If you see it with um, a portostomic shunt, it's usually secondary to severe hypoalbuminemia. These cases often have concurrent protein losing enter enteropathy or a heavy parasitism load. Some older dogs may only present with signs of cystitis or urinary tract obstruction from urate calculi and ammonium biurate crystals. Um, presenting signs include dysuria, polyuria, hematuria, strangeuria, and urinary obstruction. And these are often PUPD as well. Because of decreased urea production, increased renal ammonia excretion, and decreased uric acid metabolism, Formation of ammonia urate calculi are common and can be associated with a secondary bacterial urinary tract infection. Calculi have been documented in up to 36% of patients with portosystemic shunts. Um, there have been recent investigations into the severity of clinical signs and when they develop related to the specific shunt pathology. While not always the case, um, clinical signs are often milder in dogs with portozygous or portophrenic shunts. Um, the theory is that these shunts are likely compressed by the diaphragm during respiration or with gastric distension after meals, resulting in periodic improved portal pressures. And this suspicion was recently confirmed in several studies. Um, in one report, overall pre-op clinical signs were more common in dogs with portal cable than portal zygous shunt insertion. So 88% had signs compared with 58% um, with portal zygous. Um, additionally, shunts that insert caudal to the liver were more likely to result in clinical signs than those inserted behind the diaphragm and cranial to the liver, as seen with portozygous and portophrenic shunts. Um, and in this study, splenal cable shunts caused more clinical abnormalities than any other shunt morphology. Another study reported that dogs that were asymptomatic were more likely to have a splenophrenic shunt um, and were significantly older than dogs in the symptomatic group. In addition to the signs mentioned above um, associated with neuro, GI, and urinary system, um, there are several other PE findings that can be noted. It is important for these cases to evaluate for any other congenital defects as they can be seen concurrently. In one study, cryptorchidism was reported in 30% of male cats and 50% of male dogs. Um, however, such a high occurrence has not been noted in other studies, but still good to check for it. Um, heart murmurs also are frequently identified. They may be incidental flow murmurs in young patients or indicative of other congenital cardiac defects. And then copper colored irises inappropriate for the breed have also been documented, particularly in cats. 
Um, this is my own personal cat that I had um, before vet school, Peanut. He had a shunt. You can see he's got that very classic um, copper covered colored irises. So got him before I knew anything about any of this. Blood work is the first step in diagnostic workup of animals suspected to have an extrahepatic portosystemic shunt. CBC, chem panel, UA, and coag panel should be performed in each of these patients. Um, and then these, this is just a summary of the most common abnormalities found. So I'll go into the detail of what we see and why, but don't feel like you have to memorize all this. It'll be on each slide. On the complete blood count, the most common findings are leukocytosis and microcytic, normochromic, non-regenerative anemia. Uh, leukocytosis has been suggested to be due to increased antigenic stimulation from de decreased hepatic endotoxin and bacterial clearance from portal circulation. In some studies um, in the past, it's been associated with a poor prognosis, but this has been contraindicated in um, recent literature. The opposite actually has been found. Anemia is suspected to be due to abnormalities in iron metabolism, but the exact pathogenesis of congenital portosystemic shunt associated anemia has not been described. Um, microcytosis has been reported with or without associated normochromic non-regenerative anemia in 60 to 72% of dogs and 30% of cats. Abnormalities and markers of liver function are very commonly identified in dogs and cats with congenital shunts. Typically, they result from decreased hepatic synthesis and include hypoalbuminemia, reduced BUN, hypocholesterolemia, hypoglycemia, and um, in cats, hypoalbuminemia is uncommon and low BUN concentrations are more frequently identified. Creatinine is also frequently decreased in dogs with portosemic shunts. The GFR and renal volume are increased in 81% of dogs with congenital shunts and will decrease significantly after shunt attenuation. Um, so this may be an additional explanation for the low BUN and creatinine that's seen pre-op. Mild to moderate increases in serum liver enzymes are also common. Usually we see a two to three fold increase in ALP and ALT. ALP concentration in dogs with shunts are usually higher than ALT, which is likely from contribution of bone isoenzyme in these growing animals. It's typically uncommon to see enzyme values more than fourfold higher than the high end of the reference range. So in these cases, it's important to consider concurrent liver disease if they have the greater than fourfold higher. So for these cases where the enzyme liver values are markedly increased, at that point, we'd recommend a biopsy at the time of shunt attenuation. Common UA abnormalities include de decreased USG and ammonium biurate crystal urea. More than 50% of dogs with congenital portostemic shunts are hyposthenuric or isosthenuric. The low urine specific gravity likely results from poor medullary concentration gradient from the decreased urea production in the liver or from hepatic encephalopathy and the associated psychogenic polydipsia. Biurate, uh, ammonium biurate crystals, as you can see in this picture here, are reported in 26 to 57% of dogs and 16 to 24% of cats. Hyperammonuria from the deficient hepatic urea cycle combined with deficiency in the uric acid cycle results in excessive ammonia and urea, urea excretion from by the kidneys. And so these compounds can precipitate into crystals or stones in the kidneys, which are noted in 30 to 36% of cases, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, proteinuria is often seen in dogs with congenital shunts, and when it's not associated with the UTI, it's suspected to be secondary to glomerular sclerosis or other underlying glomerulopathy. A study evaluating risk factor for urolithiasis in dogs with extrahepatic shunts found that shunt morphology was not associated with an increased odds of urolis in dogs, but Male dogs, older dogs, and dogs that were previously medical management before evaluation um, were at a higher risk for stone development. Dogs with congenital shunts frequently have coagulation abnormalities. However, spontaneous bleeding is very rare. Um, in one study evaluating coagulation parameters in dogs with congenital shunts, they had on average a more prolonged PT, lower platelet count, lower antithrombin activity, lower protein C activity, and increased D-dimer levels compared with the reference population. 
evidence of bleeding or thrombosis was not detected in any animals, however. And anecdotally, I found this to be true as well. Um, I have seen some cases where they do have a prolonged PT and PTT, but it's not um, been clinically significant or they've made plasma or anything like that. Once we have suspicion for potential shunt based on the blood work sign signalment, um, the next diagnostic tool, as you all know, is gonna be liver function testing. Um, abnormalities in liver function testing are suggestive of liver disease. However, no blood tests are definitively diagnostic for any individual of the hepatic vascular abnormalities. The test of choice for evaluating liver function in animals with a shunt is the measurement of a fasting and two hour postprandial serum bile acid concentration. Other options include ammonia and ammonia tolerance testing, and measurement of protein C is another variable that's currently being investigated. Within the liver, bile acids are synthesized, conjugated, and sec secreted into the bile canaliculi, where they are collected and stored in the gallbladder until released into the duodenum after a meal. They are reabsorbed from the ileum, transported into the pornus venous system, and then extracted by hepatocytes for enterohepatic recirculation. In animals with a congenital portostemic shunt, a persistent increase in bile acid concentration results of shunting of reabsorbed bile acids into the systemic circulation. So for this test, um, pre and post pre and postprandial bile acids, um, a fa patient's fasted for 12 hours and then a pre-sample obtained. Patients given a meal and a blood sample is obtained two hours after feeding. Normal fasting bile acids are less than five to 15 micromolliliter of normal dogs and greater than 25 in 95% of dogs with shunts. Bile acids measured two hours after a meal are usually greater than 75 in dogs with congenital portostemic shunts in a majority of cases. In some studies, increases in postprandial bile acid concentrations are 100% sensitive for detection of a shunt. Other studies have found that this paired samples, not the individual measurements are 100% sensitive, so we usually recommend the paired samples. Um, falsely decreased results have been reported and may occur with delayed intestinal absorption, lack of gallbladder contraction, inadequate food intake, delayed gastric emptying, and maldigestion. It is important to note that normal Maltese dogs can have falsely elevated bile acids because of a chemical that interferes with the spectrophotometry. And then spontaneous gallbladder contraction can also occur between meals. So this results in a prepandal bile acid concentration that's greater than the post. When you have false negative results from bile acid testing are suspected, um, you can do a baseline ammonia evaluation or an ammonia tolerance test. The primary source of blood ammonia is from the GI tract with more than 75% being generated by bacterial metabolism in the colon. Ammonia is delivered to the portal blood to hepatocytes, which converts it to, to urea via the urea cycle. In animals with a poor systemic shunt or other liver dysfunction, this conversion does not occur efficiently, resulting in increased blood ammonia concentrations. Baseline ammonia concentrations are not as sensitive as bile acid measurements, especially after prolonged fasting or with effective medical management of hepatic encephalopathy. Ammonia concentrations are reported to be abnormal in 62 to 88% of cases. In, in one study, measurement of six hour postprandial blood ammonia concentration increased the sensitivity for detecting liver dysfunction up to 91% in dogs that had shunts. Animals that have a normal baseline ammonia concentration and suspected liver disease can be challenged with administration of ammonia to determine their ability to clear the substance. This test is obviously contraindicated in any case that has um, clinical signs of hepatic encephalopathy. Ammonia tolerance testing can be performed by administration of ammonia chloride either orally or rectally. The rectal route is better tolerated and easier to perform. Samples are evaluated before and 30 minutes after administration of ammonia chloride. And this test is not frequently used because it's not necessary in animals in which increased um, serum bile acids and other imaging modalities support the diagnosis. So I think it's not um, performed as much because we just have better options, but um, it still can be useful. Results of ammonia testing are affected by multiple variables, include sample handling. Plasma separation and lab analysis needs to be performed within 20 minutes of sample collection, which often makes it difficult to perform in, in most practices. 
Protein C is a vitamin K dependent serine protease enzyme synthesized in the liver. Once activated, it works to promote fibrinolysis, modulate inflammation, and inhibit apoptosis. In dogs, protein C may be useful for distinguishing congenital portostemic shunts from primary hypoplasia of the portal vein without, hy without portal hypertension, i.e. microvascular dysplasia. Um, in normal dogs, the protein C activity is 70% or greater. In 88% of dogs with shunts, the protein C level is below 70%. And in 95% of dogs with PVH MVD, the protein level is 70% or above. Because protein C does not differentiate normal dogs from PVH MVD, it cannot be used as a sole discriminatory test for the presence or type of liver disease, but it is useful to differentiate a congenital shunt from microvascular dysplasia. Following surgery, dogs also have been shown to have post-op improvement in protein C activity. So serial evaluation of protein C levels may be useful for detecting improved liver function after shunt attenuation. There are several different diagnostic imaging modalities that have been utilized to support or confirm the diagnosis of portostemic shunts, including abdominal radiographs, abdominal ultrasound, CT angiography, nuclear scintigraphy, mesenteric photography, and MRI. Abnormalities on survey abdominal radiographs that are suggestive of but not diagnostic for portostemic shunts include micropatica and bilateral renomegaly. Small liver is seen in 60 to 100% of dogs and 50% of cats. Urate stones are usually radiolucent and so not apparent on x-rays. Um, however, they, they will be radiolucent, or sorry, they will be radioopaque if they're combined with struvites, which we can see occasionally. And then there was also a study in cats that found that some pure urate stones were radiodense and therefore detectable on x-rays. This is an x-ray of a dog, a puppy that had a shunt. Um, you can see he has a small liver and then he's got a very large bladder. He uh, presented for a urethral obstruction. Um, you can see there's no stones visible in this x-ray, but then we did an ultrasound. He did have stones consistent with urates at the time of surgery. Abdominal ultrasound is one of the most widely used tools for diagnosis of portostemic shunts. Reported sensitivity and specificity are variable and range from 68 to 95 percent and 67 to 100 percent respectively. In general, the detection of a shunt is often operator and experience dependent. There is a marked decrease in false negative results with increasing experience. Common findings include decreased number of hepatic and portal veins, a subjectively small liver, and an anomalous vessel. Extra hepatic shunts can be harder to find than intrahepatic because of the small patient size, small vessel size, variable shunt location, and activity of the patient during scanning. It often requires sedation to get a complete evaluation as well. If a portostemic shunt cannot be identified, color flow and pulse wave Doppler imaging can help detect changes in color flow. Doppler ultrasound has reported sensitivity of 95% and a specificity of 98%. Ultrasound guided percutaneous splenic injection of agitated saline was recently evaluated for the diagnosis of congenital shunts in dogs. So in this study, saline was mixed with one milliliter of blood, agitated, and then injected into the spleen. And then the portal vein, cauda vena cava, hepatic vein, and right atrium were all examined ultrasonographically for the presence of microbubbles. Um, this technique permitted a diagnosis and differentiation between extra and intrahepatic shunts and between portozygous and portocapal shunts. CT angiography is considered the best diagnostic imaging procedure for diagnosing shunts in people. Um, it has been shown in animals to have a 96% sensitivity and 89% specificity. It is performed rapidly, provides 3D imaging, is non-invasive, and can provide excellent anatomic localization of shunt origin and insertion. CT was shown to be 5.5 times more likely to correctly ascertain the presence or absence of a congenital portostemic shunt compared to abdominal ultrasound. There was also a recent paper that reported CT and geography provided an excellent overview of shunt anatomy and provided information about various tributary vessels that could be overlooked during surgical exploration. 
Another useful non-invasive method for detecting portostemic shunting is nuclear scintigraphy. Um, this modality is used very commonly for shunt diagnosis um, at some institutions like the University of Tennessee. Um, technetium administration can be either transcolonic or transplenic. Either method enables calculation of the shunt fraction, which represents the amount of blood that flows through the shunting vessel and bypasses the liver. Transplenic administration is preferred because it provides a better scintigraphic study and uses less radionucleotides, so there, therefore it improves its safety and it allows an earlier intervention. In addition to the shunt fraction, scintigraphy is able to provide information about the number and location of the shunts. It is 100% sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of shunting in dogs with congenital porostemic shunts, and it can be used to determine whether the shunt termination is at the ozygous, cauda vena cava, or one of the tributaries. In about 70% of cases, it allows differentiation between multiple and single shunts. The main complication is risk of splenic hemorrhage and injection outside splenic parenchyma. Intraoperative mesenteric photography was historically used to diagnose shunts. Um, this technique is highly invasive, but it's sensitive. Um, the main benefit and why it's still used by some surgeons is the ability to also measure, measure portal venous pressures intraop and confirm that there's no remaining shunting vessels. A jejunal or splenic vein is catheterized as seen in this image. This is a jejunal vein. Um, and radiopaque sterile water, so soluble contrast, is injected. Radiographs are performed one to three seconds after the beginning of injection. Alternatively, can use fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy now is used more commonly, but if you're gonna do radiographs, the sensitivity is dependent on the position. It's 85% in dorsal, 91% in right lateral, and 100% in left lateral. So ideally, you're doing these in left lateral. A direct injection of the spleen can also be performed. However, less contrast reaches the shunt quickly and the contrast that remains in the spleen may obscure the shunt itself. The main limitations, how, how invasive this technique is, obviously it's an exploratory surgery. Um, the expense, difficulty in interpreting images based on patient position and exposure of team to radiation. It's rarely performed for diagnosis because we have those other less invasive methods, um, but still occasionally used intraopity, like I said, to confirm occlusion of all tributaries. MRI with angiography provides 3D imaging of the shunt in good to excellent detail. Exact anatomic position can be determined easily, but the scan is often time consuming and expensive. Reported sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of a single shunt are 79% and 100% respectively. CT angiography provides similar detail, is performed more quickly, and it's often less expensive than MRI, so um, that's performed more routinely. I would say here we do either abdominal ultrasound or CT, it's kind of case dependent. There are both surgical and medical treatment options for single extrahepatic shunts. The goal with medical management is to decrease the transport of factors absorbed from the GI tract to systemic circulation. The goal with surgery is to occlude blood flow through the aberrant vessel, thus directing blood through the available portal vasculature. This is the treatment of choice for single congenital shunts to encourage return of hepatic blood supply and regeneration of hepatic tissues and to discourage progressive liver atrophy and fibrosis. Even if owners elect to proceed with surgery, medical management is always indicated preoperatively to reduce the risk of complications. Usually we're recommending it for as a minimum of two weeks. Um, this image is a gastrocaval shunt, um, pre and post temporary ligation. I like this image. You can see the shunt right here labeled S. And then once it's been temporarily occluded, um, you can see that all of the blood goes back to the the liver through the portal vein. Um, I just think that this is a good representation of how the blood flow to the liver is restored. And then of course, how you have that regeneration of hepatic tissue um, with surgery. So me medical management, it's recommended before any anesthesia is performed for the diagnosis and treatment. It should also always be considered for long-term treatment whenever there's a shunt detected, but surgery is not possible or it's declined. Um, like I said, medical management controls the clinical signs associated with shunting, but it doesn't resolve the underlying diminished hepatic perfusion. Therefore, surgery is recommended in most cases. We'll go into the specifics of what medical management involves, but it's usually a protein-restricted protein diet, lactulose, 
antibiotics and anticonvulsants if necessary. As mentioned previously, signs of hepatic encephalopathy can be abnormal mentation, stupor, tremors, ataxia, seizures, and coma. Treatment of acute severe hepatic encephalopathy includes administration of warm water enemas, oral or rectal lactulose, antibiotics to decrease urease producing bacteria, and the anticonvulsant therapy if indicated. Nothing should be given by mouth until the patient is alert, aware, and able to safely swallow. If an animal presents recumbent or dehydrated, IV fluids are administered to normalize and maintain hydration. Some clinicians avoid the use of LRS because of the need for hepatic conversion of lactate to bicarb. However, this issue is um, most likely theoretical rather than clinical. So um, if all you have is LRS, use it. Otherwise, we try to avoid it and use another crystalloid. Factors that contribute to hepatic encephalopathy, such as hypokalemia or met metabolic acidosis, should be corrected slowly with IV fluids. Glucose should be supplemented in IV fluids as needed because in these young puppies with shunts, um, they often have um, glycogen stores and gluconeogenesis being minimal. Seizures are initially treated with diazepam or another benzodiazepine. Some clinicians prefer midazolam over IV diazepam because diazepam contains a propylene glycol carrying agent that requires liver metabolism. Others feel that diazepam is the anticonvulsant of choice for immediate effect in an animal having a seizure from hepatic encephalopathy. So really there's no consensus and either use is controversial, just as long as you give either midazolam or, or diazepam to stop the seizure, that's what's most important. Um, after seizures are controlled, either a loading dose of pheno, KBR, or Keppra can be used in IV form. Our neurologist here prefers Keppra, and we usually start at a dose of 20 mg per kg IV. Q8. Another option is zonisamide at 5 to 10 mg per kg VID, which is more convenient than the thrice daily Keppra. Um, I don't have much experience with zonisamide, and there's no importance to my knowledge of using it with HE associated seizures, so um, that's why we lean towards Keppra. Speaking of nutritional management, have some coffee. Uh, nutritional management is particularly important in young animals with shunts that often have a poor body condition. Protein-restricted, highly digestible liver diet is essential. Protein should be moderately restricted with a dietary goal of 18 to 22 percent for dogs and 30 to 35 percent in cats on a dry matter basis. Another way of evaluating is that dogs with shunts need do two grams of protein per kg body weight a day. This is higher than the protein content in most kidney diets, which I think is important because I think we used to really push low protein diets for these, and now it's much more focused on protein restricted. Um, Hills LD, Royal Canin Hepatic are excellent prescription diets to meet these requirements. Um, if additional protein is desired, owners can add a couple teaspoons of yogurt with active culture to the food. Milk and uh, vegetable proteins are lower in aromatic amino acids and higher in branch chain amino acids than animal proteins. These sources are less likely to precipitate hepatic encephalopathy, so that's why milk and vegetable proteins are preferred. Lactulose is a disaccharide metabolized by colonic bacteria to organic acids. It can be administered either, either as a high colonic enema or orally. Lactulose function in two ways. It decreases ammonia production and acts as a cathartic. So it promotes acidification of colonic contents, which results in entrapment of luminal ammonia in the form of ammonium, and then decreases the colonic bacterial number. Its osmotic effect produces catharsis, which reduces fecal transit time and intestinal exposure to bacteria, which further helps minimize ammonia production and absorption. When given orally, it's usually half a mil to one mil per kg um, POQ8 to effect of two to three soft stools per day. I recommend owners monitor stool um, closely. You ideally want to, the stools to be soft, kind of like soft serve, um, but don't want the patients having diarrhea and becoming dehydrated, especially in these small little nuggets, these tiny little guys that we're, we're managing these um, medically. Um, often I tell owners they need to adjust the dose in the first few days to reach desired levels. Um, so just that's something to keep an eye on. Usually once you get it, kind of that desired consistency, it, it stays that way. 
Antibiotics decrease urease-producing bacteria, which further decreases bacterial byproduct absorption and bacterial translocation. Options include metronidazole, ampicillin or amoxicillin, and neomycin. Neomycin traditionally was the antibiotic of choice, but now recommend to avoid if there's any evidence of intestinal bleeding, ulcerations, or renal failure. The dose of metronidazole you'll notice here is lower than what we would need, use for other conditions, and this is because of the inability of the liver to process effectively, so we need to go lower. Um, our team here, so I would say our medicine and our ER team, prefers amoxicillin um, because they've still seen side effects of metro even at these lower doses. Um, where I trained, we use metronidazole, so I think both are good options and some of that's gonna just be what you have and clinician dependence. Seizures. Cats with preoperative generalized seizures that are not controlled by routine medical management should be placed on phenobarbital two to four weeks before surgery with a maintenance dose ultimately based on blood concentration and response to therapy. Um, Keppra, again at that 20 mg per kg POQ8 dose, has also been used to control seizures of other causes, but its use for treatment of seizures associated with portostemic shunts in cats has not been that well reported. Um, Keppra seems to be favored by no, most neurologists because it is well tolerated. Um, we use Keppra here instead of phenol you know, for these cases, but um, both are good options. It is important to warn owners that anticonvulsants may be required for at least three months after shunt ligation in cats with post-op seizures because of the high rate of post-op seizure recurrence. The use of pre-op anticonvulsant therapy in dogs remains a debated topic. So um, it's often employed for patients that present neurologically with hepatic encephalopathy. So yes, if you have a dog that has preoperative signs, seizures or neurologic signs, then start an anticonvulsant. Um, some surgeons routinely prescribe it before any congenital shunt attenuation. And so there's conflicting literature as the benefit of pre-treatment -pre with Keppra prophylactically. So if they don't have any neurologic signs. There's one retrospective study. Um, this is kind of what a lot of the evidence was based on initially that showed pre-treatment with Keppra at least 24 hours before surgery and administered at 20 mg per kg POQ8 prevented post-op seizures. In this study, dogs pre-treated experienced no post-op seizures, whereas 5% of dogs not receiving pre-op anticonvulsants experienced seizures. Um, this is really the only study that has shown a prophylactic anticonvulsants to be beneficial. Anecdotally, I've seen cases develop seizures despite being on Keppra. And this study has been brought under scrutiny. So um, I think there is an additional retrospective study that came out last year um, that evaluating the effect of prophylactic Keppra on preventing post-attenuation seizures. It was multi-institutional and it had 940 dogs. The overall post-op seizure rate was low at 8%. And there was no statistically significant difference between the different groups indicating prophylactic treatment with Keppra did not offer protection against post attenuation seizures. So I say for me, if I'm seeing a case and they don't have signs, I usually start lactulose, the protein restricted diet and an antibiotic. Um, if it's a, a case presents to me and um, they've started Keppra, I don't usually stop it, I continue it. You know, I think um, the tough part is it, it's a low percentage of these cases that do get seizures, um, but when they do happen, as we'll talk about, they're pretty catastrophic and Keppra seems to be pretty well tolerated, which I think is why a lot of people use it is, you know, it's kind of one of those, well, what's the harm if starting it? But we don't actually know if it's protective or not. So um, I think, you know, it's, it's not wrong to use, but do we have the evidence for it? I'm not sure. So get off my soapbox now about it, but. Long story short, if you sent me a case that was started on Keppra, I wouldn't judge you. I think it's totally understandable. It's, it's just I don't, I don't do it because, I, um, like I said, I've seen cases where even when they're on anticonvulsants, they still get the seizures afterwards. Nutraceuticals for hepatic supportive therapy have been recommended for a variety of liver diseases. Um, unfortunately, there are no controlled studies have evaluated their effectiveness for treatment of animals with hepatic vascular malformations. Options include SAMe, Ursodiol, vitamin E, and milk thistle. Um, they're all proposed to improve hepatic regeneration and detoxification. If you're gonna use, veterinary formulations are recommended as many over-the-counter brands do not actually contain sufficient amounts of the active ingredients. 
Animals with intrahepatic shunts in particular have a predisposition to the development of GI ulcerations. GI bleeding ulcerations are treated with an H2 receptor antagonist such as famotidine or proton pump inhibitors such as omeprazole, also sucrophate, mesoprostol. Um, lifelong treatment with a proton pump inhibitor is currently recommended in dogs that have undergone intrahepatic portostemic shunt attenuation. So use long terms in these cases have been shown to improve prognosis. Gastric ulceration is uncommon in dogs with extrahepatic shunts, so um, usually we don't administer these prophylactically in these cases, only if they have signs. Few studies have evaluated the prognosis for animals with congenital portostemic shunts with medical management alone. Prognosis with long-term medical management can be good in dogs that have good portal blood flow, which is about 35% of dogs, um, but it's poor for the rest. Average survival time for medical management in dogs are 9.9 .9 months to two years, um, depending on which study you read. There are no good predictors as to which animals will do better with medical treatment alone, although dogs that are older at presentation have minimal clinical signs and have an albumin and BUMN, sorry, yeah, albumin and BUMN close to normal are suspected to have a better prognosis. There was a prospective study published in JAVMA in 2014 comparing long-term survival and quality of life in dogs that underwent surgery versus medical management. In this study, neither age of diagnosis nor shunt type affected survival rate. Um, surgical treatment resulted in significantly improved survival rate and lower frequency of ongoing clinical signs compared with medical management. Surgery involves identifying the anomalous vessel and placing either a gradual attenuating device or acute ligation. Liver biopsies are performed if liver enzyme values are markedly elevated. Um, we used to take liver biopsies frequently because there are certain histopathologic fe features that were thought to carry a worse prognosis. However, in more recent studies, there's been no statistical association between histologic features and survival time or prognosis. Additionally, dogs with PVH MBD share hepatic histopath changes similar to those with macroscopic congenital shunts, so it's not beneficial to distinguishing the two. Like I said, usually take them just if we um, have, we're worried about something else going on. These animals can have concurrent cystic calculi, and so a cystotomy is performed at the same time if that's identified. We do see a subset of cases that present for urethral obstruction, no other clinical signs, and the shunts identified on ultrasound when we're looking for the cause of obstruction or with a suspicion based on the breed. Ideally, medical management is performed for two weeks before, but when they have an obstruction, we need to potentially proceed sooner, right? They're in the catheter with, or sorry, in the hospital with a, a, cath, a urinary catheter in place. Um, so with these cases, we usually start medical management and then perform surgery 24 to 48 hours later. Um, I usually have a conversation with owners about either staging procedures or performing at the same time, knowing the potential risks. Um, I've done both. I've done where we've done a cystotomy, started medical management, done a cystotomy, and then done surgery for the shunt a couple weeks later. I've also done it where we've done it all at once. So it's just a conversation with the owners about what the risks involve with either. Realistically, if the patients are asymptomatic, there's a low chance of having post-op complications, but I still wanna warn owners that it's not an ideal situation when this happens, and it just kind of forces our hand into intervening surgically sooner than we'd like to. Definitive diagnosis of congenital extrahepatic shunts can usually be made through an exploratory laparotomy, provided you have a good understanding of the anatomy. Um, there are a couple of key locations we look in the abdomen to identify a shunt. Well, I know these cases will most often be referred for surgical management. I think it's still a good idea to feel comfortable knowing where to look in case you find one incidentally during a explore. If you have a suspicion for a shunt, the abdomen should be opened cautiously to avoid lacerating any shunts that may be traveling within the falciform ligament. It's not common, but it has been reported and it obviously can be detrimental if they're transected. The entire abdomen should be explored for any anomalous vessel because animals can have more than one. And then in general, when you're identifying a shunt, you're looking for where they insert on the systemic veins. So you're basically, you're looking at the cauda vena cava, the left phrenic vein, where the ascygis would be. Extrahepatic portal cable shunts are often identified on the right side of the abdomen at the level of the epiploic foramen. To visualize the cauda vena cava in this area, you retract the duodenum to the left. 
In normal dogs and cats, um, there are no large vessels entering the cauda vena cava between the right venal and hepatic vein. And these vessels often contain turbulent flow, the shunts do themselves, and the cauda vena cava can be dilated at the site of insertion. So this image is, um, I lost my arrow, okay. So the, this is your duodenum, your pancreas, it's all been um, retracted to the left. You got your cava, and then this is your hepatic artery, which is on the border of one of your, your epiploic foramen, and then you've got your big shunt right there. Gastrophrenic or splenophrenic extrahepatic portal cava shunts are being reported with increased frequency, as many as 37% of cases in one study. These shunts travel along the lesser or greater curvature of the stomach and ventral surface of the esophagus. Uh, they terminate on the phrenic vein at the level of the esophageal hiatus. So you've got here, um, you've got your stomach, your lesser curvature, and you've got a nice big um, shunt coming in right here. This is an image, everything's been retracted to the right, your diaphragm's right here, your stomach, um, this is your phrenic vein, and then you've got your left gastric coming in and you've got a gastrophrenic um, shunt right there where that asterisk is. This is another example of a gastrophrenic. It's similar to that other image. You've got your esophageal hiatus right here. Um, oftentimes where we find them, you've got your diaphragm, your left phrenic vein, gastric vein, and then the shunt again going in between. Porterozygous shunts are frequently found in animals that are two years of age or older when clinical signs are first detected. These shunts usually traverse the diaphragm along its crura or at the aortic hiatus or through the esophageal hiatus. Usually we see them at the aortic hiatus. To locate these shunts, it's often necessary to enter the omental bursa by tearing through the ventral sheath of the omentum. So you attract the stomach cranially um, after you go through the bursa and then you attract the intestines caudally and laterally and then you can view the portal tributaries. If you don't see it within the omental bursa, occasionally you have to attract the liver and stomach to the right so you can see the cardia, esophagus, and left diaphragmatic crura. Um, you can see that here. So this is, again, kind of similar to that previous picture. It's just a little bit more dorsal. Stomach's been retracted to the right. You've got your aortic hiatus here, and then you've got your shunt coming in right here. Um, these vessels usually dive through the thorax, and you don't visualize where they actually insert on the zygous. Um, there are reports about going into the thorax to ensure you're getting all the tributaries, but that's not usually necessary. What we're doing is usually just putting your attenuating device right here, just as close to the diaphragm as possible. And I haven't talked much about them, um, but they're also, we can see colocaval shunts. Um, they're usually identified entering the cauda vena cava or iliac vein at the level of the sixth or seventh lumbar vertebrae. You've got your cauda vena cava here, your colon and your left colonic vein, and then you've got a shunt right here. So in general, when you're looking, the main areas that when I go in and look, I'm looking at the right side of the abdomen near the epiploic foramen, along the lesser or greater curvature, look in the omental bursa, and then near the aortic and esophageal hiatus. And oftentimes you can kind of see it in different areas. So sometimes I'll identify it in the bursa and then kind of connect it up um, either to the, the cava or is it diving up forward if it's a phrenic or um, is I guess. So um, you can kind of see it in different areas. And I really do think that the turbulent flow helps to identify it as well. Options for surgical treatment of a single congenital porosemic shunt include partial or complete occlusion with ligatures or more gradual attenuation with amyloid constrictors, cellophane bands, and hydraulic occluders. Acute complete occlusion can result in death from portal hypertension, so gradual attenuation is therefore preferred to reduce the risk of having any post-op complications. Um, this is an image of cellophane banding around a shunt, which I'll describe in a little bit. The amyloid ring constrictor consists of a stainless steel ring with an inner casein core. Casein is a hygroscopic substance that swells as it slowly absorbs body fluid, reducing the ring's internal diameter by 32%. With the outer ring of stainless steel, the casein is forced to swell inward, and hence that's where you get that occlusion over time. It also stimulates a fibrous tissue reaction that in combination with the swelling causes gradual shunt occlusion within three to five weeks of placement. The choice of amyloid ring constrictor size is based on shunt diameter. Preferably, the constrictor should have an inner diameter that's larger than the shunt because you don't want to cause too much constriction all at once. Before placement, the paravascular fascia is gently dissected away. 
Dissection is minimized to prevent post-op movement of the constrictor rin and subsequent acute shunt occlusion. After an opening has been made through the fascia around the vessel, the shunt's flattened um, by elevating either with sutures and open right angle. And then the amyloid ring constrictor is slipped over the flattened vessel. And the slot in the constrictor ring is obstructed with the stainless steel key you can see right here. So you put this, use the slot, you put the ring on, and then this goes in to um, keep it in place. Um, it is important to place this or any occluding device as close to the cava vena cava or the diaphragm as possible to try to include or to ensure inclusion of all the shunt tributaries. And this is what we um, do here most commonly. Cellophane bands can be constructed from regenerous cellulose or from thin films made of polyester or olefin. These materials currently are not available in medical grade. Um, you might see in more recent studies that they're calling it thin film banding instead of um, cellophane banding, just because of there are different materials besides cellophane. During surgery, a sterilized um, one by 10 centimeter strip is folded longitudinally into thirds to make a thick, flexible band. The shunt is dissected similar to for an amyloid and the band is pulled around the shunt and then it's held in place by three to five large hemoclips in alternating directions. Similar to the amyloid constrictor, cellophane bands cause a fibrous tissue reaction and gradual shunt occlusion. Initially, attenuation of the shunt to less than three millimeters in diameter was performed to encourage complete shunt occlusion. However, complete occlusion has been demonstrated in dogs and cats that underwent cellophane banding without this intraoperative attenuation. So it's not necessary. You literally just put this around and it still should, that fibrous um, reaction should still cause the shunt to occlude over time. Persistent shunt flow after cellophane bland placement has been reported in some cats, and it's suspected to be secondary to a reduced inflammatory response in these species. So this is a good image. This is that similar image we saw of the gastrocaval shunt. Um, here, right here in the image A, you can see that there's no shunt, and then you can see it in B. Um, in the image C, you can see that the shunt's being dissected um, and flattened, and then in D, the um, cellophane band has been secured around it. Hydraulic occluders consist of silicone and a polyester cuff connected by tubing to a vascular port. The shunt goes, the cuff, sorry, goes around the shunt and the port sits in the sub-Q space with the tubing um, channeled in between. The port's similar to that that's being used for a pleuroport or a sub, so it requires that same non-coring Huber needle. After placement in surgery, a small amount of sterile saline is injected through the port every two weeks to gradually inflate the cuff. Shunt closure usually occurs within six to eight weeks and does not depend on a fibrous tissue formation. And in most animals, this vascular access course, even though you're just using it for those first six to eight weeks, it's still um, left in place permanently, unless there's an issue. Suture ligation in dogs, it's usually performed with 2 watt silk because of its superior handling ability. I always say silk, it, it's great because it's like tying your shoelace. Um, Non-absorbable synthetic monofilaments like a polyproline um, is recommended in cats because of the risk for shunt recannulization. In most dogs, the shunt can only be partially ligated. Determining the um, appropriate degree of shunt attenuation is based on visual inspection for evidence of portal hypertension, such as cyanosis of the intestines, increased intestinal parasit peristalsis, and cyanosis of the pancreas. Portal pressures can also be measured through catheters inserted into a jugular or splenic vein. Um, the portal pressure catheter is attached to an extension set and transducer or water manometer. Recommendations for post-ligation pressures include a maximum portal pressure of 17 to 24 centimeters of water, maximal change in portal pressure of 9 to 10 centimeters of water, and a maximal decrease in CVP of 1 centimeter per water. Um, as a baseline, normal portal pressures are approximately 8 to 13 centimeters of water and can be lower in um, dogs that have shunts. This is a VD image of an intra-op mesenteric portogram of a cat um, with a left gastric shunt. You can see the shunt here again labeled S um, on the right. Um, this is after temporary full ligation of the shunt at its communication with the left phrenic vein. So here you can see with the shunt, the um, blood all going to the cardiovascular system bypassing the liver. And then once it's been um, temporarily occluded, um, you can again see that hepatic portal, portal arborization with no evidence of continued shunting of portal blood through possible tributary vessels positioned distal to the site of, of shunt closure. So, and this is why some surgeons will use this. You can kind of temporarily occlude it. Okay, okay, if I put my 
um, occluding device here, then um, we're not going to have any residual tributary vessels that allow consistent flow. After shunt attenuation, patients are maintained on IV fluids until they are eating and drinking. Dextrose is added to fluids when the BG is less than 80. Patients are monitored for hypoglycemia, hypothermia, delayed anesthetic recovery, hemorrhage, seizures, and signs of portal hypertension. Animals usually require opioid analgetics, analgesics for several days post-op. Sedation with low dose of ACE or dexmedetomidine may be necessary if dogs are vocalizing. ACE does not increase the risk of seizures after shunt surgery, and it is very useful for sedating these patients. And these patients usually are kept anywhere from 24 to 72 hours in the hospital, um, pending how they recover. Complication associated with shunt attenuation that we're going to talk about briefly again are seizures, hypoglycemia, portal hypertension, hemorrhage anemia, and then recurrent subclinical signs. Seizures develop in 3 to 18% of dogs and 8 to 28% of cats after shunt attenuation. They can occur up to 96 hours after surgery, which is often why we keep these for you know, more than just a day usually. Lethargy, facial twitching, ataxia, muscle fasciculations, blindness, and abnormal vocalization are often apparent before generalized seizure activity, and I'll show you a, a video in just a second. The cause of post-op seizures is unknown. I think that's important to warn owners about this being a potential complication. Um, it's only seen in a low percentage of dogs, but we don't know why it occurs and in which cases. So um, that can be really frustrating, obviously for all of us, but also for owners. So it's important just that they're aware of this possibility. Initial treatment involves IV boluses of midazolam or diazepam, IV. Keppra, if not already being administered, can be given IV at 60 mg per cake and continued at a lower dose every eight hours. Phenovarbital is not recommended as an initial anticonvulsant because it takes 30 minutes to reach therapeutic levels. If seizures persist or recur, the animals can be anesthetized with an IV bolus of propofol and maintained under anesthesia on a propofol CRI. IV Keppra and rectal lactulose are continued. It is important to monitor respiratory status closely, and some animals do need to be ventilated. Some clinicians use phenobarbital concurrently or in place of Keppra. Um, we usually start with Keppra, but have added in phenobarbital when seizures persist and they're not responding to Keppra alone. Mannitol at one gram per kg over 20 minutes is administered IV every six hours to reduce intracranial swelling. Electrolyte and glucose abnormalities are corrected and supportive care is provided, i.e. eye lubrication, rotating recumbency, urinary catheters. Partial or total parental nutrition should be considered in patients that have been fasted for more than 48 hours. Propofol is discontinued after 12 to 24 hours. Some animals require it for 72 hours to resolve seizure activity, so you try to discontinue it and then see if you have to restart it again. The prognosis is historically poor for animals with post-op seizures, but recovery is possible. Um, it requires extensive hospitalization, expense, and patience. In general, half of affected dogs die or are euthanized, and those that survive often continue to have visual defects and other neurologic problems for weeks to years. So we'll see if I can get this to play. So this is a video. Is there sound on it? it no, there's not okay, sound. Good. I just click it? Yep. Oh, okay, it worked. Okay, so it's on a loop. So this is a cat that had a shunt. Um, he was on medical manage beforehand as well as Keppra. Um, he did well initially, and then this is the morning after surgery, and you can see there he's having kind of focal facial twitching, facial seizures. Um, he did develop grand mal seizures about um, 30 minutes to an hour, I would say, after this, despite um, being on all of the things. So um, this is kind of sometimes what you can see before they develop a, a full-blown seizure. You also can see he's got that kind of classic copper eyes as well. Clinically significant hypoglycemia, so less than 60, has been reported in 44% of dogs within four hours post-surgery. Um, toy breed dogs are more commonly affected, and the hypoglycemia usually resolves once they're eating solid foods. It may be avoided by feeding small, frequent meals post-op once a patient is alert, um, plus or minus IV dextrose. In 29% of affected dogs, the hypoglycemia is refractory to IV fluids, 
The cause of this refractory hypoglycemia is unknown. If patients have refractory hypoglycemia, or in general, they're just having a delayed an anesthetic recovery, um, they may respond to um, glucocorticoid administration, so an injection of DEXSP. Portal hypertension is seen in 2 to 14% of patients undergoing acute surgery ligation, sorry, suture ligation, and is less common with gradual occlusion. This condition is serious and can be fatal. Um, monitoring for clinical signs include abdominal distension, abdominal pain, uh, systemic hypotension, prolonged CRT, pale mucous membranes, and GI hemorrhage. Um, these patients are usually, it's more painful than just your normal uh, post-op pain. Patients with acute severe portal hypertension should be supported with oxygen, warmth, IV crystalloids, GI protectants, um, systemic antibiotics, and analgesics. Affected animals are evaluated closely for hypotension and evidence of DIC. Mild cases resulting in ascites um, are usually self-limiting and they resolve on their own in days to weeks. Spironolactone or furosemide can be administered to decrease abdominal fluid if a patient is uncomfortable or dyspneic. In the presence of severe clinical signs, DIC or hypotension unresponsive to fluid therapy, removal of the occlusive device is required. Intra and post-op hemorrhage is uncommon in animals undergoing extrapatic shunt surgery. However, acute anemia can be seen postoperatively in dogs that have received large fluid volumes or have splenic sequestration of red blood cells from portal hypertension. After these dogs recover completely from anesthesia and excessive fluid is excreted, the PCV usually returns to preoperative values. It's very uncommon to require a blood transfusion, knock on wood, because I have some shunt surgeries coming up the next few weeks. The most common chronic complication is persistence or recurrence of clinical signs. Um, differentials include continued flow through the original shunt, presence of a second shunt, development of multiple acquired shunts, presence of congenital um, PBH MPD, or unrelated disease. Animals with clinical signs or biochemical changes that um, indicative of liver dysfunction should be imaged. In 18 to 21% of dogs, the shunt does not um, close completely, resulting in residual flow. Factors predictive of continued shunting are uh, low pre-op albumin, high portal pressure after complete shunt occlusion, and high portal pressure differences. Treatment recommendations depend on the presence of clinical signs and the cause of residual shunting. Surgical intervention is recommended for patients with a second congenital shunt or clinical signs related to persistence flow through the original shunt. If you have um, persistent flow noted through the original shunt but there aren't any clinical signs, usually we don't do anything about that. If you do an ultrasound and there's no blood flow um, through the primary shunt and no additional shunt is um, identified, then histopath should be considered. The most common cause for increased bile acid concentration in a relatively asymptomatic dog is congenital PBH MVD, which can be confirmed with uh, biopsy. And once these animals are full grown, we can often perform laparoscopic liver biopsies um, if needed. Um, I've done it in dogs less than five kilograms, so the nice thing is it's obviously less invasive and um, we can still get large samples that way. So a little plug for laparoscopic liver biopsies. Um, Development of portal hypertension resulting in multiple acquired shunts is uncommon, but may occur in 10 to 20% of cases undergoing surgical treatment for a single congenital shunt. Um, it is suspected to occur when the liver is unable to tolerate the increased portal blood flow, and so you have um, those fetal blood vessels open in response. Treatment um, with this condition is focused on controlling clinical signs of hepatic encephalopathy and um, slowing the progression of liver disease. Medical management is continued for several weeks to months post-op while the gradual occlusion occurs. Protein-restricted diet and lactulose are continued until liver function improves. Antibiotics are continued in patients with clinical signs that are not controlled by diet and lactulose or that have concurrent urinary tract infection. Bile acids are usually rechecked two or three months after surgery. And if the liver function is improved to normal, medical management is discontinued. Typically, the medications are slowly weaned over two to three months after surgery, removing one treatment at a time to confirm resolutions of clinical signs. So I usually stop antibiotics by suture removal. 
depending on how patients tolerate antibiotics, I'll or sorry, tolerate lactulose, I'll occasionally continue antibiotics and discontinue lactulose at that time. Um, but if they're tolerating lactulose, I try to have them stop the antibiotics, continue the lactulose and diet. It's just some owners with, with um, lactulose being so sticky, they have a hard time giving it. So some of that's kind of case dependent. Once we have the recheck bile acids at two to three months, I usually stop lactulose um, at that point, and then I stop the diet uh, two to four weeks later. In many patients, the bile acid concentrations do not return to reference range. Therefore, assessment may be based on clinical response to diet and um, medication change in animals with mild follow-work abnormalities. In one study, all dogs undergoing surgery had a resolution of clinical signs, but 16% had continued abnormal blood work findings. I would say anecdotally, we see a higher percentage of persistently elevated values. So usually at that two to three months, they're significantly in, improved, but I think it's actually uncommon that they're totally back to normal at that point. Um, if bile acid concentrations are moderately incre increased, medical management is continued. So either lactulose and protein-restricted diet or just protein-restricted diet, and then animals rechecked five to six months post-op. Normalization of bile acid concentration is not correlated with long-term outcome in many reports. So I don't get discouraged by persistently elevated liver, uh, um, sorry, persistently elevated bile acids. As long as routine biochemical parameters like a BUN and albumin return to normal and clinical signs are well controlled. Several factors have been evaluated to identify which cases have a poorer prognosis. The patient's age or body weight at the time of surgery was both found to not be associated with post-op mortality rate or long-term complications. And there's been no evidence that the shunt morphology or means of shunt attenuation affect prognosis. In terms of what's been shown to be a negative prognostic indicator, as mentioned earlier, an elevated white blood cell count was thought to be a negative prognostic indicator, but this has been contraindicated. Um, Preoperative anemia has been associated with a poor long-term outcome. In dogs um, with hepatic uh, poor systemic shunts that underwent amyloid constrictor placement, the pre-op albumin concentration was associated with continued shunting after surgery, but not mortality rates. For every decrease in albumin by one, the odds of continued shunting increased by 3.76 times. And for every increase in albumin by one, the odds of an unsuccessful outcome decreased by 0.4. Overall, the use of amyloid constrictors and cellophane bands for attenuation results in good outcomes. Prognosis for dogs is excellent after amyloid constrictor placement or cellophane banding, with 85% of dogs becoming clinically normal within four months after surgery. In another study, good to excellent outcomes were noted in 78 to 94% of dogs undergoing suture ligation, cellophane banding, or amyloid constrictor placement. Once the shunting vessel has been occluded, dogs experience increased liver volume, presumably from hepatic regeneration. The prognosis is a little more guarded in cats. Um, the perioperative mortality rates are zero to four and a half after amyloid constrictor placement, zero to 22% after cellophane banding, and four to 20% after suture ligation. Up to 75% of cats have been reported to have postoperative complications. The most common complication is neurologic dysfunction, including generalized seizures in 8 to 28% of cats and central blindness in up to 44% of cats. In cats, the development and persistence of post-op neural signs is not correlated with the presence of pre-op seizures, shunt location, degree of shunt attenuation, or age of cat. Blindness usually resolves within two months after surgery. And of surviving cats available for follow-up, um, good to excellent long-term outcomes in one study was reported to, from 33 to 75% undergoing amyloid constrictor placement and 57 to 80% undergoing cellophone banding. So that's pretty much everything I have on extrapatic shunts. Um, this is again, Peanut who had a shunt. Um, and if you guys have any questions, let me know. I guess you might have them already, we'll see. Oh gosh, 11 questions. Oh, good. A lot of these are. Oh, wait, hold on. Those are, those are Andrea's. Good, they're Andrea's. <laughs> um, protein C is good. Just one question. Yes. I don't think there's any. No, there, is protein oh, C the same sorry. as C-reactive protein? No, they're different. Um, but they're both kind of involved with the liver, which I found really confusing. But no, protein C is different. Any other questions? 
Okay. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, you guys can always email me if you have any questions. Um, what does it mean if someone raised their hand? Did Pina have surgery? Good question. He did. Um, it was when I was in vet school and he did have surgery and he did well initially. He didn't have any seizures. And then a couple months afterwards, he went um, septic. We're not quite sure well. He was managed with neomycin medical management for five years before surgery. Um, and then he, um, Andrew, you can come in. And then he had um, a urethral obstruction, which I think is why we ultimately went to surgery. So ended up being sad, but he did great for um, after surgery for a couple months. So. And he was uh, the best cat ever, and honestly why I went to veterinary medicine, because I learned about shunts because of him, and then got into that field, and yeah. So, okay. Well, thanks, guys. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any other questions.